that's what I'm about. <clears throat> okay, so as I've mentioned numerous times, right up until this point, these are the different hats that we're wearing as you're creating imagery. I mean, a structural hat and emotional hat. And the visual pathways that we went over last day right, can function in both ways. And so you can get structural visual pathways that essentially you know, do this, point towards the center of a frame. Right? That's one way of thinking about a pathway. They can do these things, right? They can help push the vertical edge of the frame in from one side or the other, and as a result, push towards one side of the frame or the other. And then they can also do this, right? Kind of push you around the frame, right? Or do this, push in that pattern or that pattern, right? Those, so those are all structural visual pathways you know, in terms of like directing visual traffic, telling your audience like where it is you're supposed to be looking, controlling their viewing pattern, right? et cetera. So you can help to establish right, this as a way of accentuating the image hierarchy of what's more important than another thing or equivocating between them, et cetera. You can also have emotional visual pathways. <clears throat> right? Now those visual pathways fall into two, or sorry, into three general categories. Right, where you have things that are essentially structured in a predominantly horizontal pattern. And the end result of this is that you have scenes that end up feeling relatively calm if things are organized in this pattern. You have things that are structured in a predominantly vertical pattern, which have the tendency of making things feel more tense. And then you have things that are structured in a predominantly diagonal pattern that might include verticals, horizontals, right, et cetera. But the important thing about the interaction of those lines is that they're intersecting each other at a wide variety of angles. And these have the tendency when we create something like this, creating a dramatic type of impression. Now, when we are talking about patterns like this, what we're talking about is, again, any perceptual category can create these patterns. So line being most obvious, right? creating horizontal, vertical, or diagonal patterns. But we can also have that created by objects, value. When we review color next week, that can be right, a way of dealing with things, detail, texture, et cetera, anything can create this, create, create this pattern. And any combination of those things can create that pattern. And we can look at this thing in two different ways, or these things in two different ways. We can look at them in terms of like a general design. And so things that affect the overall design of your picture. And we can also look at these things in terms of object design things that will be individual elements of that general design. Our primary concern is this. This essentially influences that and can add nuance to it. But because we're generally, because we're pattern seeking creatures, we have a, we have a tendency to recognize that general pattern first and then the individual objects that make up that general pattern secondarily. So perspective plays a huge part in creating this. Which is, you know, why I've been trying to incorporate um, perspective into your assignments up until this point so that you're thinking consistently about that perspective and how it affects all of these general patterns and the emotional states that it tends to create. So what would be say, a per, an element of perspective that we've already done, right, that we've started with right from the beginning that would help to create this overall feel. Chuck out a term that might be horizontal in direction that would be inside the frame that might help to create that feel. Horizon line? Your horizon line. So generally speaking, right, when you have your horizon line in frame, 
what that does is it creates a stabilizing influence. I mean, stabilizing influence in the sense of the familiarity and comfortability, right, the reflection of the world that we normally perceive, but also, right, um, a stabilizing influence in the sense that it has this, we have this natural reaction to this. A good way of thinking about this is to try to personify this. Think about, you know, people lying down. People sleeping, people dead, right? That's an easy way of creating that overall feeling. Whereas if we were to associate, say, a person standing straight up and pointing straight up, that's an easy way of creating a sense of tension. Okay? Thinking about that thing being pulled apart right, in this direction, you know, fighting against gravity all the time until it reaches a breaking point. Right? We're, feeling, we're, incre we're, we're increasing a sense of visual tension inside a picture by incorporating this pattern so that we can increase, or so that we can increase that emotional tension in an audience. So that when we get to a point where say, we need to snap that tension to create a sense of action or drama, right, et cetera, we can do so and as a result, give what's called a cathartic reaction to your storyline, where your audience, after that buildup of tension, experiences the release of that tension. And all of these different states or all of these different states affect each other. So that when you start to get into a perspective that say crops the horizon line out in terms of a high crop or a low crop, or what I'll call a subtle three point, when you get rid of that stabilizing influence of the horizon line, what you start to do is privilege vertical lines inside the frame, right, to a greater degree. And as a result, we start to lean more in this direction. What about dramatics or a dramatic scene? What kind of perspective would be really useful to create a dramatic scene? Two one point, point. And one point. One point, sort of, right? But what what kind of one point? A one point vanishing point, and then two point everywhere else. Uh, Dutch tilt. Okay, so that's Dutch tilt isn't a perspective. It's more of like an affectation of the crop with respect to a perspective. But you're right. We can incorporate a Dutch tilt in order to create that effect. Well, we've just talked about this as being a stabilizing influence. Oh, okay, God's so, eye or worm's eye. Right. So, okay. So, a bird's eye view, a worm's eye view, right? or what we'll call, say, a, an extreme three point. I right? think about that scene in Ghost in the Shell right, that we watched, right? Where you have that chase scene essentially down the alley, where it's a long sequence of these kinds of perspectives as that person's being chased down the alley, looking for the person that's chasing them. Right? You're constantly moving between a shot like this, a shot like this, a shot like this, a shot like this as a way of exaggerating that sense of drama because right, of the exaggeration of those diagonal lines and the removal of that horizon line. Okay, so all of those things. Horizon line and frame, cropping the horizon line out, right, incorporating more extreme perspectives or a Dutch tilt, those are all different ways of using perspective right, or the crop as a way of accentuating these visual patterns, right? And these are things that you're gonna to have to incorporate into your assignment, into your assignment this week. Now it's important to recognize as well, you can use any perspective in order to create any of these, um, uh, any of these effects. These are just useful things to think about so that you're thinking about varying your POV um, and are generally kind of the most widely associated types of perspective with these individual states. But there's no reason why you can't create this right, with this, right? So for instance, like if you remember way back to Roger Rabbit, that clip, there was a scene that had a really subtle Dutch tilt to it, but your vanishing point was, and your horizon line was directly in the middle or directly inside the frame, right? And then you had a series of kitchen, kitchen influence flying out of the, or flying out the wall or flying out towards Roger, right, as he's, right, really or extricating himself from the ironing board. That was a really dramatic scene, right, but has the horizon line inside the frame. And so there's exceptions to what it is that I'm um, essentially outlining, 
but for the most part, this is generally how you'll see things. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do for your assignment. Because that general pattern right, is heavily influenced by these types of things. So for instance, like if I put, if I want to create a comm scene, and let's say that I want to just draw a house. As soon as I put this inside the frame, that automatically leads me very, that automatically starts to accentuate that calm feeling, but it also starts to accentuate the natural horizontality of the frame. So the frame itself is already kind of leaning in this direction, simply because it's in landscape. Now, if I want to create a house, I can do so in a variety of different ways. First off, creating something that is maybe long and low and flat in terms of its overall design. And then that helps to create a visual pattern. Now, if I was to put say a fence now in front of that house, I want to create a long low fence, right? That then helps to continue that, the bottom of the house. The bottom of the house and the bottom of the fence being so closely related to each other, your brain basically assumes that those things are the same thing. It'll combine those things into a single pattern as opposed to separating those things into individual objects. So it'll do this all over the place. So if I put clouds, for instance, I can make long, low clouds like that, that fall into this general pattern. But I can also arrange multiple clouds along the same overall horizontal pathway. And your brain basically connects those two things together. It's looking for this relationship. And if you establish that relationship inside the frame, it's going to, um, it's going to exaggerate that relationship or complete that relationship. And so we're not only looking to do things like this, like say long, low hills, lonely house on the prairie type of thing. We're also looking to do stuff like this, where it's like, all right, well, if I want trees now inside that scene, I'm designing them in a long, low way, but I'm also looking to line up the bottom of this with the bottom of this so that those things right, now help to exaggerate a pattern. Okay, so your brain is trying to create those patterns. And if you create them um, intentionally or otherwise, your brain will recognize. Them, right? so it's important not only to be able to, you know, not only to be aware of this to create those patterns, but also to avoid the creation of those patterns when you don't want those things to be incorporated. And importantly, it's like, it doesn't matter if that scene is made up of predominantly vertical objects in order to create a horizontal pattern. We'll recognize the pattern first. So let's say that I do a close-up of that fence. But I create that fence pattern like this. Even though these are all vertical objects, we've got a strong horizontal here, a strong horizontal here, and we get strong horizontals there because those things are all lining up with each other. And likewise, I'd like to say that, you know, you could see the ground plane here. That would be another horizontal pattern. So you can have horizontal patterns made entirely of vertical things or diagonal things because you've lined them up with respect to this. There's a historical period called the Byzantine era where you had essentially people floating in abstract spaces all lined up like this, all vertical elements, but all of their heads lined up like this, all of their feet lined up like that. And as a result, and they're all presented in a horizontal format. And as a result, this creates horizontal bands structure. And so what we've got here is essentially abstract, abstract pattern where 
your brain sees this. first, and then the individual elements that set that up afterwards. And so this functions on an abstract level as well as a representational level, simply because we recognize that pattern right, um, as a primary point of our emotional influence as opposed to the individual objects. Okay, so if I was to have shadows right, being cast right by that tree, those things would be moving in a horizontal pattern. Same thing with shadows cast by, that, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You're trying to beat me over the head with the fact that you're trying to create that overall feeling. Um, okay, does this, before I go on to these, right, does this general concept right, make sense or is it hazy at all? Okay, cool. Right, so when we get into dealing, uh, this is a decent page to to screenshot. So that means when we get into a sense of tension, what we're trying to privilege is this vertical pattern. Now, again, you can have horizontals right, inside of this. You can have diagonals inside of this. But if you want to think about it in a particular way, it's like I mean, you, this a scene that was say structured like this might be big T, right? little c, so to speak. And so there's generally a mixing and matching of these directional patterns. I mean, unless you're doing a close up of rain right? or some shit like that, or blinds, you're not gonna have things that are moving perfectly vertically all the time, right? But for instance, like the scene, like my image right, for you guys is predominantly vertical with the verticality of I mean, the door or the door lines, et cetera, where there are those little diagonals towards the top right, that are getting close to horizontal, most things are vertical inside that frame. And so you're always going to have like a mix and matching of these things. And the more mixing and matching that you do, the closer you start to approach a sense of realism, because we generally experience all of these different kinds of directional patterns right, whenever we're looking at an image. Our job is to basically push them in one direction or another. So with respect to that, with your perspective, we're gonna to try to crop the horizon line out of the frame, either above or below the frame to either create a high crop or a low crop or a subtle three point. Now, what I mean by a subtle three point is this. So if we go back to the three point stuff, Remember that all your vertical lines are moving towards a vanishing point at one end of that central area. So with your low crop, you're cropping the horizon line out. With your high crop, you're cropping the horizon line out. But we never have a problem with vertical lines being diagonal because all of your vertical lines are running perpendicular to the horizon line. With a subtle three point, what I mean by a subtle three point is that you're using an image that kind of clusters around the center of vision. So that all of your vertical lines in here are closely resembling the center of vision and its perfect perpendicularity to the horizon. Line. So there's only so much of an angle you're going to get as you get here. So that's what I mean by a subtle three point. Extreme three points exist more out here. Okay. And then those become more dramatic. So these are more tension oriented and these are more dramatically oriented. So let's say that I designed that same, that same scene in a high crop, or sorry, in a low crop. Well, first off, I know that I want my horizon line out of the frame. So I'm gonna design a scene that doesn't have it in right from the beginning, but I'm also gonna change the overall nature of my house. Uh, let's do this instead.
and getting some sort of like Tim Burton -y design, right? As opposed to um, right, the long little flat design. And then in in uh, in addition to that, like I'm incorporating details into it that would also be vertical in nature. What I'm also trying to do is avoid patterns, right? That help to establish any sort of horizontal banding. So I don't want to line objects up with the top and the bottom of that stuff the same way that I don't want to have this incorporated into the picture. So if I'm going to put a tree in here, first off, I'm going to change the overall shape of that tree altogether so that I get something more vertically oriented. Right? But now I'm trying to avoid this lining up with any other feature of the picture so that they can't create any sort of perceptual band. So if I want to put another tree, I might crop that out, incorporate that up over here. This is now, now again, this isn't lining up with anything. And so if that's lining up with the top of the door, I want to create some sort of staggering effect. If I'm going to put a fence around this house now, I redesign the nature of what that fence is going to be. My sidewalk, long and skinny, in the front, right, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm privileging this stuff here. Now, in addition to this, and because again, we're cropping out the horizon and you, you can do shit like this. You can bring right, one of those trees really close to the front of the picture and incorporate that foreground material right, and right, use this structurally to help you know, create a focus force left or a focus force right, right, but also to incorporate a higher degree of vertical banding inside that picture as a way of pushing it towards this. Okay, so this is what I mean by the individual details. And, but then hopefully it's like, it, it's obvious what I mean by that overall pattern as well. And that exact same scene, easy enough to create in a down shot or a, a three point down shot. I'm just trying to cluster those lines more closely to the center of vision. But now when I create my house, you know, now it's got a little bit of extra flair to it because those vertical lines are going to someplace down there. Same thing with the tree. Whether or not it be foreground Or otherwise. Okay, so you can do either of these high crop, low crop, right? Three point up, three point down, as long as it clusters towards the center of vision and privileges those vertical lines as a result. Right? And this is a really useful way of also incorporating that focus force left, focus force right, but also the foreground stuff that we've been working on uh, into the picture as well to increase proximity increase that sense of tension inside the picture, and, but also provide a lot of visual variety because now we're starting to switch perspectives as well. You know, this doesn't have to be created again by single objects. We could do this with a line of objects. So let's say that you wanted to create a row of houses. trapped in suburbia style. Okay, well that creates the same vertical banding that this does. If we now had a series of fences inside there and then say a road, a 
and then you know, goofy trees, forest and behind, <laughs> Shyamalan and then village style, right? That starts to incorporate right, a more vertical nature to it as well. So we can have those that same banding being made up of individual objects that are all clustered along a pattern to create the exact same sort of effect. Okay, so you really have to do this in your assignment as well. Shift between those different perspectives as a way of creating one of these types of effects. And again, this can be exaggerated through shadow, like I can have like a long, creepy shadow coming out from there as a way of exaggerating that effect, et cetera. Okay, any questions about how to create that sense of tension? Okay, so screenshotty. And lastly and not leastly, how do we create that sense right, of drama? Right, now, the main thing is, is that we want Right. anything inside that scene to have as many diagonal lines as possible. So a Dutch is a really easy way of doing this. Because you can take that initial scene of the house right, and the fence and all of the details inside that. You just do this to it. And when you reorient that, that automatically destabilizes things and makes it feel more dramatic right? because now we've got this, 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 all working at cross purposes to each other. Okay, so for those of you who, you know, still perspective isn't your favorite thing, so to speak, this is a really easy way of creating that effect without having to go to a more complicated perspective. And I would recommend doing that you know, as well. I mean, it's not a get out of jail free card right, sort of thing, right? But it is a way of making your life easier and achieving the same overall effect. But if we want to go to, say, a different kind of perspective, and draw that same house. All right, well, now we can start to incorporate vertical lines like this, so going to your three point vanishing point, but now rather than say dealing with a one point, we can also start to incorporate two points right into this as a way of creating that effect. So if we draw that same house now, maybe that house Right, or we change the design of the tree altogether, right? So that now, rather than you know just a vertical tree, now we get you know, trees that come out at a variety of angles. You know, classic horror film trees. You ever notice is like in most horror, most horror movies, like it's always winter or fall. All the trees always look like this. It's because they're creepy, soft, fluffy point or soft, fluffy clouds right? and soft, fluffy trees don't look scary. Right? Shit like this does. 
and you can also have like the details of this thing starting to exaggerate that as well. So rather than maybe, you know, a window that's just post and lintel style, maybe that window is broken. And so you get more jagged details influencing the overall feeling of things. So maybe rather than that door hanging off the side of the open frame, we incorporate that thing now hanging off right when there's an extra board kind of like splintered off. You got the paneling of the side of the building right, broken. Right? Breaking shit is a really easy way of making things feel more dramatic. And then if we've got clouds off in the background, maybe we just like we have some really dramatic clouds as well but they're all moving in different directions as well okay so the more angles that you include regardless of whether or not it's value right object right shapes interacting with each other lines interacting with each other the more diagonals they have the more dramatic it's going to be right and your bird's eye worm's eye and more extreme three points right are really useful perspectives as a way of making that happen okay but again don't necessarily have to have a really dramatic perspective you can have just an op you can just have objects lined up right, along a diagonal path right so that same row of houses And just be set up like that. Same fence, same trees. Same sidewalks, right, et cetera. Right? And that would be more dramatic. Okay, so it's the pattern itself that's important. Right? The perspective that we're associating with them right? or the cropping, this is me just trying to get you guys to think about this stuff right at the same time. Because ultimately what we're trying to do is associate your narrative arc. And so your setup, conflict, and resolution stages. With what's called an emotional arc. These things generally run current or run concurrently with each other. And again, in a kind of stereotypical traditional formulaic setup, what we have right, is a sense of calm developing here. As that information is established, that calmness helps to kind of like emotionally level your audience's introduction to all of that new information. But then as that conflict is introduced, a sense of tension starts to arise. Right, as characters are faced with obstacles, right, they have to overcome those obstacles, right? Things are literally standing in their way of getting what they want or overcoming them, right, et cetera. And then as that tension is released, we get a sense of drama where you get a, that cathartic release of um, all of that accumulated tension. And depending on where you are in the set or um, in terms of percentages of scenes that you have, you're basically kind of shifting genres. So let's say that, you know, along this emotional arc, that you have a dominance of dramatic scenes. If you had to pick, like, say, a, a genre of film. What kind of, what kind of genre would you be in if there are more dramatic scenes than anything else? Like action so I, or horror? Okay, well, action for sure, right? right? But what about the horror? What makes a good what makes a good horror film? The building of the tension, building of and the then tension. like the big. Right. So here we get the tent. Like in a really good horror film, not a lot of action actually happens. Right. Yeah. Right. It was like it's the release that we crave, right? In a horror film. Right, so it's that unbearable tension that you're building throughout that. 
Whereas in an action film, yeah, there's little bits of tensions in terms of conflict, but what you paid to pay, what you came to pay, or what you paid to come and see is the fight sequences, right? The car chases, the explosions, right? The et cetera. That's what we want to see, right? And everything else is basically kind of like wedged in between those areas, right? As little as possible. So you get as much of this as possible. Where in a horror film, we get as much of this as possible and a little bit of this as the payoff for us, like torturing ourselves to watch this thing for however many hours. Right? And then this would be like your, you know, a lot of dramas, rom-com, right? That type of stuff. Right. For the most part, things are relatively calm. We get a little bit of this, right, in order to make it interesting. Right? But now it's like you can start to decide basically what kind of story you want to tell right? in terms of where you're, atti or where you're attributing focus to. Okay, so this is going to be your job for your assignment. Right? Is that each, or you have to have at least one of these represented in your narrative, or in your narrative act. Or sorry, in your in your story, but we're going to combine this with other stuff that you've already already done. So we know that we need to have an overall patterning like this for the calm scene. We also know that the horizon line has to be in frame for that scene. And so those are characteristics that we have to have. You also have to label that scene as being calm. Right, so that I know that you know that we know right, what it is that we're doing. What did we do last week? What kind of structure goes with your setup? The circular structure? Right, the circular structure. So your golden section. Right, so you also have to label that. So two things you have to label here right, and that are acting as restrictions in addition to the perspective that you're using for that scene. So whoever's doing that scene has to do all of these things. Again, here, foreground is optional. But if you use foreground, again, label it narrative or descriptive. Whoever's doing these scenes, foreground is not optional. Right? So here you have to label foreground and we're gonna use it in a narrative sense. What kind of structure do you have to use? High crop, low crop. Okay, so yeah, we have to use a high crop or a low crop or a subtle three point. So that's the perspective that you have to use. What kind of structure from last week do you have to use as well? The right carry, left carry. All right, so the focus force left, the focus force right. And you can call it asymmetrical, you can call it this, you can call it left carry, you can call it right carry, doesn't matter to me. Right, but you have to label this, just like you have to label that. We're using this perspective as a way of accentuating this. And then you also have to label that. Okay, so whoever's doing this one, you have to label three things for sure. Here, you might only have to label two, maybe three, depending on whether or not you're using this. Here, we're privileging that, so we have to label that right, for that scene. <clears throat> what perspectives are we using here? Potentially. Uh, three point, worm's eye or bird's eye. Okay, so extreme three point, bird's eye or worm's eye. Or Dutch tilt or you can Dutch it, great. Right. What's the structure that you're using? What's left over? Pyramid. Pyramid, a pyramidal structure would work really well because diagonals are built into that, whether or not they're like this or like this. So that's a really good structure to use. What's the other thing though as well? Goes along with a pyramid or not, doesn't matter. High contrast. That's a tonal thing, but what's a structural thing? Oh. So when you put shit in the middle, what do we call that? Focal point. Yep, but what's the structure called?
Meredith? No, nope. Meredith. That's not the structure. That's not the structure. Uh, <laughs> Come on, guys, you got this. It's the one that we've been doing the longest. What's that? Elliptical. Sorry, again? Uh, elliptical. You have to speak up, man. It's like I can't hear you. Elliptical. Did you say symmetrical? No, no, elliptical. Like circular. I can't, I can't understand what you're saying, but, but either way, wait. Symmetrical, so, right? So whoever is doing this one, right, or that scene has to do this, right? So you have to label that as symmetrical. All right, what did we do last week? We went from dark to light. Let's go light to dark again. So we're moving now from light towards dark. Right? And what's going to be what's going to be more dramatic, high contrast or less or low contrast? High contrast. High contrast, right? So we're moving to a high contrast scene here from a low contrast scene there. So effectively what we're doing is like, we're just kind of like wrapping up everything that we've done, right? Up until this point, right, in the class and now attributing it to, right, developing a story structure with it. So these are your restrictions in terms of, all right, these are things that work, right? But now that you have to, but now you have to apply to your story structure. And because you already have your color theory class, next class, what we're going to do is attribute, use it basically as a review of color theory, but then use that as an additional tool, as a way of accentuating how you start to develop your stories. Okay, so you have to have at least one of these. You have to have at least two of these because you have to have both the left and the right, gray, focus force left, the right or right. Um, Right, asymmetrical left or right, whatever you want to call it. And you have to have at least one of those. You can basically decide where you put right, the other um, the other seeds. Now you guys are working in groups of five right now, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, now we can do a couple of different things. Right? Your last assignment, I'm gonna I'm gonna want you guys to, to work in one big group because right, it gives us or actually your last two assignments so next week right, and the final assignment i'm going to ask you guys to work in one big group because it gives us an opportunity to create more of a complicated story and then gives us more room to kind of um, talk about how to develop a storyboard right what story structure looks like how you edit that stuff right etc where when we're dealing with four or five frames it's relatively straightforward and simple so my question is basically, do you want one more assignment where you're working in two groups of or two groups of five, or do you want to do that um, big group now? Actually, you know what? I'm answering my own question. Let's just do, let's keep the same groups for right now. In the last two assignments, um, we'll do it in one big group, but that's what's coming. Okay, so be prepared for that. Everybody's so angry today out on the streets, so angry. Okay, does what we've gone over make sense? Do you have any questions about what your assignment is? Okay, well then all that's left to do is, I now have the great privilege of showing you guys clips from one of my favorite films, if not my favorite film altogether, which is a, about as close to a perfect film as you're gonna get which is a rare thing for me to say, a rare thing to experience. Um, and the lovely thing about that film as well is that it provides in the clips that I asked you to watch both a really formulaic development of this whole narrative arc, emotional arc, right, et cetera, but also um, a really nice example of the subversion of that as well, right? So the opening sequence is basically this. Right. You get an arc, right, that leads up to this, right, with that murder of the deputy scene. And then you get, right, what's called a denouement or a declining action, 
right after that, where that cycle starts over again. And that's basically the way that you can think about a story, right? Whereas like you have a long series of these ebbs and flows right? as so long. Say in like a, a feature film, you might have a lot of these overall peaks and valleys as you gradually move towards the ultimate point of the story. So this film is really, really good for doing this, but it's also really good for defeating expectations that are developed right through this traditional use of a story arc, which is again, why I think this movie is so good because it basically takes even traditional story structure right, and places it, what was it, what would be a good way of saying it. It accentuates it when accentuating traditional story structure serves the purposes of the story that it's trying to tell, but then it undermines it when it undermining that traditional story structure, right, would serve the purposes of the story that it's trying to tell. And all of those things dovetail really perfectly together to tell a very particular kind of story. So, You know, as I've mentioned before, there are a number of different ways of creating emotion, focus, right, et cetera, right? We just, you know, we're breaking them up and we've been breaking them up into individual chunks. Now we're combining all of them. So here you would have, right, remember that value always wins. Right, in terms of creating both emotion and structure. So when you have a low contrast situation, right, that's automatically gonna feel like a co relatively calm scene, right? Because of that compression of value. And here that compression of value is accentuated by this long, low horizontal, long, low horizontal mountain, et cetera, the horizon lines and frame, the banding of the colors all horizontal, et cetera. And so all of this is telling you that, all right, this is a nice calm environment that you're being introduced to, right? And then still relatively calm, but now you get these verticals that start to kind of poke up. So this is what you would say call like big C, little t, so to speak, right? There's a little bit of tension starting to be introduced to this, but the overall patterning is still horizontal. The overall contrast is still horizontal. And what's really nice about this sequence is that that contrast gradually starts to increase, right? While the structure of the thing stays relatively the same. So here we get a little bit more high contrast, but we still have that same horizontal structure until we get that like an abrupt change of that, right? So you got much higher contrast in this, but now you start to get, incorporate right, these diagonals into it, still balanced out by the horizon line being in frame. So now you get a scene that's telling you things at cross purposes, right? Something that feels a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more tense, right? But also is like still relatively calm because the structures relatively horizontal, but the contrast right, is a little bit more dramatic. And this is a nice way of introducing everything that's gonna happen in the sequence, right? So here you see again, we're, now we're back to very much like a horizontal patterning, but now we have really dramatic contrast, right? Between one side of the frame and the other. So now you get, again, two different things being communicated at the same time. And that basically continues, right? With high contrast, some verticals and diagonals being incorporated, horizon line in frame. And this starts to incorporate more of a sense of naturalism and complexity right, to that picture. And that basically continues until you get to here. And, and you can kind of see like the visual exclamation mark that this essentially provides. And then how they accentuate that by throwing that into a symmetrical scene. Is that you can literally think about this as an exclamation mark in terms of trying to punctuate a point of tension. And this dovetails really nicely with what the voiceover is saying at the time where this is the Tommy Lee Jones character talking about um, how he had to send a kid to the electric chair for killing a 14 year old girl, right, et cetera. It's like these things are timed as a way of accentuating 
each other. Okay, so what we've got is a gradual rising action from really low contrast, really low drama, or really low drama to really high contrast, right? And developing a sense of tension. And then that sense of tension just gets continued, right? With the introduction of these vertical characters and high contrast. So we're just in the business now of starting to create tension. That tension gets broken a little bit here through these diagonals that are incorporated into the scene. So there's a bit of a release here. But then that tension's continued, right? the vertical shaft of the highway moving directly up the middle of the frame. But then here, the structure of everything changes completely. So this is what we might call, say, a, a high crop. And look at how the scene is divided up into different vertical bands. Vertical band here, vertical band here, vertical band here, vertical band here, vertical band here. Vertical band here. As a way of accentuating the tension of what's about to happen, so that when it actually does happen, we get a dramatic change in angle. This would be what we say call a subtle three point, predominantly vertical. And when we get to this sequence here, okay, this is a good way of say accentuating right, a sense of drama by personifying it, right? The angles of the legs as the struggle Right, continues. But then if we go to do, 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 this here, really dramatic perspective, really dramatic subject matter. And as these characters move back and forth like this, watch how the camera is moving as well, so that it's moving in the opposite direction. So that's exaggerating the angularity of what's happening in the action with respect to the frame. And it continues to do that. Right, until right, it settles in on this character's face. Because right, what they're trying to establish in this sequence is what this character is capable of. Right, so that as this movie progresses, this violence basically follows this character, right? The, potential, the potentiality of this character's cathartic release right, and dramatic right, and drama that's associated with that violence always follows this character, which is what makes that other scene so effective, the Kontal scene, right? Because in that sequence, you have a build of tension, but you never get the release of the tension, right? So this would be a way of giving the audience what they want, what they expect, so to speak, right? Because you get a really dramatic presentation of really dramatic subject matter that follows the building of tension, whereas the other scene doesn't give that, right? And what's, excellent about this sequence, right, although be it uncomfortable to watch, is that, is that as soon as you have this happen, you get a cut to this, right, where everything levels out, this character relaxes, the scene relaxes, right, and you get a deflation of all of that drama. So it's like, if you want a picture, it's like there's been a rising to this point, right, and then there's a steep drop off. And then that rising action and that settling action help to accentuate each other. You can't feel dramatic about a particular thing unless it's in contrast to other things that aren't dramatic. And so even if you wanted an action, like even if you wanted to develop action movies, you can't have just all drama all the time because people just tune out. You need to have the breaks in between as a way of accentuating that drama. So when the struggle finally ends, Right, and he stops kicking. Right, you get that last pathetic kick of the leg, so to speak. Right, and that you know, relaxation of this character. You get a relaxation of the camera angle as well. But what's interesting about this sequence, not only how these things work together, but it's like what they cut to here. So if you're storyboarding this, right, the description in the scene Right, might be hands enter into frame screen or from screen right, right, and you know character cleans up, cleans blood off hands. A pretty typical way of showing that scene would be something like this. Sink here, 
hands come in here, faucet there, that's all calm. What's this scene in terms of calm, tense, dramatic? Which one is it? Okay, what's dramatic? Diagonals, verticals, or horizontals? Diagonals. Okay, so are there any diagonals in this scene? No. No, so what is this? Tense. Tense, okay. This is what the structure okay, looks like. You've got a big band here. You get a big band here. You get a band here. Right? And then you get another band here. And there is right, a little bit of horizontal here, but that's it. There's a little bit of horizontal here as well. So what this does is it takes that scene that was calm beforehand. And now because this has been introduced, it continues the tension. And so if you want, it's like that sequence kind of did this, right? Reached a crescendo there quickly drop back down and now it's starting to rise again. So when that's, so when we come here and this is a really good example of say what mark making does. So we don't concentrate on this a lot, right? But you know, when we talk about line quality in this, in the, uh, pools that I swim in, right? when you make pencil marks or, or brush strokes right, or whatever, this is called mark making. Right? And the importance of that is that it has an emotional characteristic to it. If I make, if I shade like this, that's, and I can see those pencil strokes, it's going to accentuate a sense of calm. If I shade like this, and I can see those pencil strokes, it's going to accentuate a sense of tension. But if I shade like this, and I can see those pencil strokes, that accentuates a sense of drama, right? So how you start to refine your drawings, right? At this point, right, makes a big difference. And when you see this scene, right? And you get, you know, this diagonal of the foot, this alternate diagonal of the foot and leg, but then you have all those boot marks. That's essentially what pencil marks do, right? And the kinetic nature or the dramatic nature of all those boot marks help to accentuate the drama, right? That's just happened. So what we now have is that we've gotten another crescendo here. You know, it's, this is kind of arbitrary. It's like how, you know, I'm setting up how dramatic they are. Right? And the importance of this is that when you continue on, this character just picking this up, right? Is still represented in a dramatic way. And now if we want, it's like there's a hard cut to this, which is now back down here. That continues here, right? Look at how horizontal all of this is, right? We get a bit of a vertical, right? Chucked in here. The important thing about this scene right, is that if we think about it structurally, this is all kind of horizontal over here, right? And then we get that road. This road line is vertical, but look at how close it is to the edge of the frame. When you do stuff like this, this basically just kind of moves the frame in a little bit. What we pay more attention to is clustered towards the center of the frame, both emotionally and structurally. So whatever kind of pattern you set up towards the center of the frame, is going to take on more of an emotional importance. As you get out towards the edge of the frame, it starts to become less and less important. So it works, the same thing works structurally as it emotionally, as it does in terms of like recognizing focal points and stuff. Okay, so this is all setting up a bunch of calm scenes. And then when we get here, right, we start to introduce that vertical again. Here you get a hard vertical as well, but still right, an emotional calm center until we get here. What's this? Calm, tense, or dramatic? Um, 
tense. This is why those over the shoulder shots work so well, right? Because here we get literally an over the shoulder shot between these two characters, right? But all of this is vertical. All of this is vertical. And, and yeah, we've got a stabilizing kind of horizontal diagonal in the background. So we're looking for, we see that dominant, right? Vertical banding first. So that's a nice way of setting up, right? The sense of tension that's associated with this thing, right? And with what's about to happen. But when this happens, Does that feel dramatic to you? It's surprising, right? But does this scene look dramatic? No. No. So this is what this movie does really well, is because they've set up everything like this with respect to this character, all of this, and this is what I mean by it follows that character around, this character now always has the potential of really violent action attached to them. So that when you see this, you're expecting some sort of like really violent release of that tension. But instead what you get is this, totally deflationary in, in terms of the expectation that it's fulfilling, which is a really nice way of this movie delivering the message that I take this movie to be deliver. And there's a very good reason why for this scene, when this, when you watch this whole thing, and I highly recommend you do, it cuts from this scene to the Josh Brolin character, Thanos, right, staring through the scope of a gun, right, which is an excellent way of tying these two acts together or those two acts together. So we get to this sequence, which is fucking amazing. This whole sequence is set up like this. Over the shoulder, all vertical compartments Nicely accentuated by the nooses hanging in the background behind this character. Not actual nooses, right? But shit that looks like nooses. And effectively exaggerating the precariousness of this, this character's situation. Now, what happens at the end of this sequence? Not much, really. He Nothing. Just leaves. Yeah, he just leaves. What are you expecting to happen there? some kind of violence some sort of horrible end for this person right and you don't get that the only thing that you get that closely approximates that is this where is it Ugh, it's always so difficult to find There. Right. That's the only point that you shift those angles, right? Is when this thing slowly kind of unravels. Right. So you get this sort of a release of tension, but because of this like fingers on a chalkboard type of sound that this thing makes, as you get, right, all you essentially get is just a continuation of this stuff. I love this, this ending. Yeah. So you get again, like that shift to this, right? There's, that's the only release of tension that you get. And do that, but then you're Hold right, on. you're right back to this. I'm putting it on, I'm putting it on, I'm just like a border. Where do you want me to put it? Anyone not in your pocket? What will be mixed in with the others and become just a car. Which it is. This poor bastard. 
in the scene. Right. So again, this is one of the reasons that I really like this film is because it does shit like this. Right. It and it does this on a micro level like this, but it also does this with traditional story structure. Right. I won't ruin it for you, right, in case you haven't seen the movie. Um, but I highly recommend watching the movie. And if you do, right, we can have a conversation about um, how it goes about undermining that traditional story structure right, at that point. And so I will leave it up to you to pursue that um, on your own time. Um, OK, as promised, quick and dirty. Right? Those are all the things that I have to say is my end of term gift to you. Um, do you guys have any questions about what your assignment is, um, what we've gone over today, et cetera? We'll cover individual questions about um, your individual assignments after we've dealt with that. Okay, this is due same time, same bad channel as is normal. This is also a decent time for me to remind you that end of term is coming up. And for those of you who want to do redos, those are gonna be due relatively soon. So your last class, I believe, your last class is August 13th. All of your redos are going to be due at the beginning of that class. Okay, so if you're going down that track, this is a good time to start thinking about those things in terms of managing your time. If you're not, then well, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, any questions before we deal with individual questions? <clears throat> 